Apple's transition to the PowerPC processor architecture in the mid-90s brought with it the promise of much faster Macs. While it was a bit rough at the start, the new Power Macs did indeed offer speeds equal to, if not better than, their PC counterparts. Within a few years, though, these first-generation machines were starting to feel out of date. That is, until third parties released ridiculous upgrades. The Power Mac 7100 was one of three new machines Apple introduced in March 1994. It was the mid-range model coming in a full-sized desktop enclosure, while the lower-end 6100 has so-called pizza box form factor, and the flagship 8100 was a mini tower. They were eagerly anticipated at launch, as the Motorola 68000 series of CPUs Apple had been using up to that point were getting left behind in terms of performance. And while the new Power Macs did garner favorable reviews, in practice they faced a series of problems. The first was a simple annoyance. The machines sported a fairly typical assortment of ports on the back, but the video connector was very different from previous Macs. It was designed for use with a new monitor Apple had introduced in late 1993 called the AudioVision 14. At first, it seemed like a neat option at a time when multimedia in computing was the hot new trend. In addition to a Sony Trinitron CRT, it boasted built-in stereo speakers and a microphone up top, along with audio in and out jacks and pass-through ADB connectors for input devices. It even sported an S-video jack intended for video capture to the host computer, though this feature was never fully implemented. But to handle all these signals, Apple developed a new display interface called the Integrated Desktop Connector. And of course, it was proprietary. Anticipating that an entire range of monitors like this would be in Apple's future, engineers put the connector on the PowerMax motherboard. Problem is, the AudioVision's relatively high cost led to slow sales, and it ended up being the only monitor ever produced that used IDC. Most Power Mac buyers then ended up having to use an adapter to connect their own monitor, which was extra annoying due to its large size. The bigger problem with the initial Power Macs was that, in practice, they just weren't as fast as their benchmarks suggested. The reason was simply due to the change in processor architecture. PowerPC CPUs weren't directly compatible with the 68000 series, and it would take software developers some time to update their products to run natively. Apple anticipated this, so a software emulator was built into the ROMs of the new machines. It worked very well, but offered only limited performance, so early adopters found that in most cases, their powerful new Macs weren't really any faster. Even the Mac OS wasn't fully native, with large portions of it having to rely on the emulator, and rewriting it for the new platform was a daunting task. Many key components had been written in assembly so they'd perform well on slower hardware, and that meant it wasn't as simple as just porting the existing code to new architecture. The 7100 specifically found itself the center of one particularly amusing controversy. It had been given the internal codename Carl Sagan after the famous astronomer. Engineering codenames weren't meant for public use, but this one leaked to the press. MacWeek magazine reported on it in a November 1993 issue about the upcoming Power Mac line, in which it also revealed that the 6100 and 8100 had been codenamed Piltdown Man and Cold Fusion, respectively. The former was an archaeological hoax, and the latter was a largely debunked theory for producing nuclear energy. When Sagan caught wind, he mistakenly believed it was the official name for the machine, and also wasn't too thrilled to have his name be used alongside scientific controversies. He sent a cease and desist letter to Apple demanding that it issue a public apology, and when the company didn't respond, a letter he had sent to MacWeek was published in January 1994. 
Apple's lawyers capitulated and told the development team it had to come up with a new code name for the 7100. This made the engineers a bit upset, but they complied, choosing BHA. As it turned out, that was an acronym for Butthead Astronomer, which also leaked to the press and prompted Sagan to take Apple to court for defamation. The judge ended up siding with Apple and in his June 1994 ruling, wrote what is perhaps one of the finest statements to ever grace a legal document. It strains reason to conclude that defendant was attempting to criticize plaintiff's reputation or competency as an astronomer. One does not seriously attack the expertise of a scientist using the undefined phrase, butthead. After some continued back and forth legal wrangling, the two sides came to a settlement, with Apple issuing a formal apology. The company's lawyers told the engineering team they had to change the code name again and to pick something that wouldn't run the risk of another lawsuit. So, in a final bit of defiance, they went with law, which stood for Lawyers Are Wimps. My own PowerMac 7100 is a second revision model. Original machines came with a 66 MHz PowerPC 601, but were upgraded to 80 MHz in January 1995. There's an important task I perform with all retro computers I pick up, especially Macs, and that is to remove the clock battery before it starts leaking. This model is relatively easy to work on. After lifting out the power supply, I removed the video card and then disconnected the cables to the drives. Then I took out a couple of screws and hinged the drive assembly upwards to release it. This gives access to the entire motherboard, and I was relieved to find while the original PRAM battery was still present, it hadn't yet detonated. The 7100 came with four RAM slots, and it looks like this one's gotten an upgrade at some point. The hard drive isn't original either. This one's an aftermarket replacement sold by APS, a prolific seller of Mac storage devices at the time, and a company we've seen pop up in previous episodes. While the silk screening on the motherboard doesn't include any references to the Carl Sagan saga, which is probably for the best, it does show some cheekiness on the engineer's part. Certain chips had their own code names, and these did get called out, including Curio, AWAX, Arial, BART, and Squidlet. The big appeal of the 7100 over the 6100 was that it included three new bus expansion card slots. There was also a so-called processor direct slot, which is where the included video card connects to. It features one megabyte of video RAM with slots for further expansion, and gave the computer dual monitor support out of the box. Something added with the 80 MHz version is a 256 kilobyte level 2 processor cache card, which was optional on the 66 MHz model and provided a serious performance boost. And speaking of performance, this came along with my 7100. It's a CPU upgrade card from newer technology that was released in early 1999. By that point, these first generation Power Macs were practically obsolete, given the pace of technology in that decade. The PowerPC G3 CPU ran circles around these 601 based dinosaurs, so this card played into the if you can't beat them, join them mentality and included a 240 MHz G3 of its own. First, I wanted to get some benchmarks. Compared to the 60 MHz Power Mac 6100, the 80 MHz 7100 posts a decent increase in speed, and benefits even more with the Level 2 cache card installed. Because the CPUs in these Power Macs were soldered to the motherboard, the G3 card leverages the PDS connector. When activated, it would take over by holding the 601 chip in a reset state, so it wasn't possible to use both CPUs at the same time. Though by that point, Macs with multiple processors were definitely a thing. But what about the video card that normally occupied that slot? Newer had a clever solution for that too. You'd attach the card to an included bracket that would relocate it to an adjacent Nubus slot. A flat flex cable on the CPU upgrade then plugged into the video card, though this did mean it would end up being installed upside down. 
When I powered the machine on, though, some trouble. There was no video on screen, and it didn't seem to be accessing the hard drive, suggesting it wasn't booting. I remembered reading about a condition like this related to G3 upgrades, and on a hunch, I pulled the L2 cache card. Sure enough, that did the trick. The 7100 then booted just fine. System Profiler still reported the 601 CPU, and that's because I needed to install the drivers for the upgrade card. Once that was done, I rebooted the machine, and everything reported as it should. It wasn't a big deal that I pulled the L2 cache, as the upgrade card carries its own so-called backside cache, which in this case was a full megabyte. I kicked off another round of benchmarks, and the results speak for themselves. The G3, despite being three times as fast in terms of clock speed, is over five times as fast in performing calculations. That CPU was known for providing a big leap in terms of efficiency when it launched, and it definitely shows. The 240 MHz card wasn't the only one for this machine, as it turns out. There was a 300 MHz model as well, and I was eager to see how it compared, and if it could even make a difference on this computer. And as it turns out, yes, it pushed the machine along even further, this time coming in at six and a half times as fast as the 601, despite being just 3.75 times the stock clock speed. All of this testing was done on Mac OS 761. Later versions of the classic Mac operating system increasingly added more PowerPC native code, so less was being run in 68K emulation, and I was curious how the numbers would look if I upgraded. I bumped the 7100 up to macOS 8.6, which I've found to be a sweet spot in terms of reliability and performance, and then ran the test again. Turns out, no, it doesn't make a difference, really. MacBench 3 is already PowerPC native and doesn't seem to rely on the OS when performing its tests. But all these numbers have been in comparison to the 7100 in its stock state. How does the upgrade hold up against a contemporary machine, like a Power Mac G3? At first glance, surprisingly well. But the other tests tell a different story. The disk speeds are dramatically lower, and that speaks to the double-edged sword these kinds of processor cards represented. Sure, you could get far better CPU performance out of your older Mac, but it would still be showing its age in other ways. The 7100 maxed out at 136 megabytes of RAM, for example, while a beige Power Mac G3 went up to 768. Newer Macs also supported PCI expansion cards to add connectivity like USB and Firewire. New bus cards, by comparison, were far more limiting. Newer technology went all in on advertising in the late 90s for its upgrade products, and for some machines, they made a lot of sense. But by then, the first-gen Power Macs were around five years old, positively ancient for a computer in the fast-paced tech scene of the 90s. And these cards weren't cheap either, priced between $550 and $650 US from vendors like Newer and Sonnet Technologies. And the ridiculous 300 megahertz card I dropped into my machine sold for 700 bucks. It just didn't make a ton of sense for most users to spend that kind of money, when it would be better put towards a new computer where everything was an upgrade, compared to what you had. Still though, cards like these just go to show the crazy lengths some companies went to when it came to upgrades, and no doubt those on a budget who just needed a few more years out of their computers found them to be a welcome option. The days of seeing wild CPU swaps like these are long gone, but what's perhaps even wilder is that there was a time when they were totally normal. <laughs>